This is ESTEC, the technology development campus of the European Space Agency, a group responsible for some of humanity's most intrepid space missions. But now it's taking on a challenge that's fascinated scientists and science fiction for generations, life on Mars. A group of scientists led by Jorge Vargo created ExoMars, a project seeking decisive answers on whether life, past or present, could have existed on Mars. Life on Mars is a holy grail. Uh, everybody has been looking at, for it for a long time. And um, it's, it's a series of small steps. Landing on the Red Planet is nothing new. NASA's Curiosity and Phoenix rovers have both toured the surface, delivering jaw-dropping imagery. ExoMars, though, is digging a little deeper. This mission is very special. It will be the first time ever that we look for traces of life in the subsurface. So the rover will have a drill capable to collect samples deep. And by deep, I mean two meters. If you compare this mission to other missions from NASA, they have dug in the order of five centimeters into the ground. And what types of life exactly is it that we're looking for? We are looking for traces of microorganisms like bacteria, for example. Most likely not from the present, because like on our planet, life may have gained an early foothold on Mars as well. The program will be launched in two phases. The first in 2016 will search the planet's environment for specific gases that could harbor life, but in 2018, it'll be the main rover's turn. That's the complicated part. Mars is hardly a hospitable environment, so the ESA had to create a test bed for the rover. They call it the Mars Yard. So tell me a little bit about what it is that we're standing here in front of. How does it work? This is a half-scale model of what uh, the ExoMars rover will look like when it lands on the red planet. The rover lands on top of the platform and then the platform opens up the solar panels and the egress ramps. The rover will use a camera to find out what it has around it and from Earth we will make a decision whether we have to go this way or that way. How does that actually work then? Would, would I be sitting on Earth, for an example, in, in one of the labs here, watching whatever is happening on Mars in, well, not in real time, but in, in delayed time? Well, unfortunately, it would be great to be able to joystick the rover around, but it doesn't work. We actually see the rover twice a day for five minutes only. So in the morning, we tell it what to do, and then it works through the whole day on its own. It has to navigate, move, acquire samples, everything by itself. And then in the evening, it sends us a message and tells us what it got. So how about the size of this? The real rover will stand about this height and the front of the rover will be dominated by the drill, which is a very large box, about 90 centimeters. So in that's height. attached on the front? Yeah. And that goes straight down then, or is that a movable, movable drill? It's very dexterous, actually, because it can go down, but it also goes up and turns. There is a little hand that comes out from this part to collect the samples. So the rover has to actually deposit the sample in the hand. The hand goes in, and then all the neat science happens inside. What are some of the greatest challenges ahead for ExoMars? There's two main challenges. First of all is we have to land safely. No safe landing, no science. All scientists understand that. But the second thing is we have to land in the right place from a scientific point of view. We need to go to a place that is very old, from the very early history of the planet, where sediments were deposited in the presence of water, because without water there is no life. The ExoMars rover will have to drill through layers upon layers of solid rock to get its test samples. For that, the ESA has created dozens of prototypes, but not everything can be modeled in a lab. And if I were to land on Mars, Jorge, what, what would I find? What would the atmosphere be like? Well, if you were to stand on Mars, you would find that there is sort of a five to 60 degree temperature difference between the temperature of your feet and the temperature of your head. Why? Why would because the atmosphere is very thin and it gets cold very, very fast. 
Mars is a, a frozen desert today. And the program's challenges aren't just atmospheric, they're also political. In 2012, budget cuts at NASA, the ESA's partner, saw the program in disarray, but support arrived from a somewhat unlikely partner, the Russian space agency Roscosmos. We turned to Roscosmos and for a few months, the three agencies were working together. In the end, for various reasons, it didn't work out. But even today, it's mainly a partnership between ESA and Roscosmos, but we have very important contributions from NASA. And with NASA's recent announcement of what they say is conclusive evidence of water on the Red Planet, the ESA thinks ExoMars could be on a mission that might revolutionize our understanding of life as we know it. Because it would be the first funding of other life forms in the solar system, or anywhere else for that matter. That's very important. The second thing is, we don't know very well how life started on Earth either. I think there's very little hope that we will be able to find rocks that hold the clues to answer that question. On Mars, however, there hasn't had the same plate tectonics regime as our planet. So Mars gives us a unique window into the very early history of the solar system. So you're saying I shouldn't believe in aliens then? That if anything, if I want to believe in life in outer space, I should believe in, in the bacteria? As far as Mars is concerned, yes.